Well, this is a big crowd. Y'all having fun? We'd just like to start off our uh, portion of this uh, concert by saying that uh, we're going to have a good time, but we want to make sure that you know that all the praise and the glory should properly go to our Lord Jesus Christ for making it possible. The scripture says, praise the Lord with a loud noise, and we'll do the best that we can. Uh, right now, we're going to do a song uh, that talks about ego, it talks about pride, it talks about an actress who uh, spent her life living for the things of the world. She found herself in a place where things of the world are of not very little value, and that was in a conversation in hell with Satan face to face. It's called Stella. <laughs>
Amen. Thank you very much. We talk a lot about the Lord coming back in our songs because we feel like we live in the generation that will see Jesus part the skies. And uh, whether we do or whether we don't, we're supposed to live as if Jesus is going to come back today, and perhaps he will. It's uh, every Christian has a responsibility to live his life in such a way that he's not weighted down so much with material things of this world so that when Jesus comes, we'll be ready to greet him. Sometimes I'm afraid that Christians uh, that have success in their jobs or success financially or they're just totally in love with their girlfriends or whatever and deep in their hearts, they may feel like, I don't want Jesus to come back today because I want to live on earth. My friends, you don't know what you're passing up for Jesus Christ coming back. But I know this, when Jesus Christ comes back, it will be over. And when it's over, it's over. from Memphis, Tennessee. Is anybody from Memphis here? Thanks, Mom. Appreciate it. And Memphis is an interesting city in a lot of ways. One thing is, in Memphis, Tennessee, we have more, more churches than gas stations. That's true. Memphis is like in, right in the middle of the Bible Belt. And you know, that's a real good thing. But you know something else we have in Memphis? We have severe competition in the body of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, the Southern Baptists down there, they'll do just about anything to get you in their church. And I'm Southern Baptist, so I'll go for that. But, uh, you know, then you got the Pentecostals, and they try to get everybody, and the Methodists, they try to get a few. And that's all good, except when it becomes competitive. 
What is competition in the body of Christ? Can somebody tell me? It's sin. You know, it's amazing that we can get 25,000 people out here to a Christian music concert. But is there a church anywhere that you can tell me it's got 25,000 people? Korea. Korea? So what have they got? They got unity. If we could only have unity in the body of Christ, how much more could we do for the kingdom? How much more? Everything. Amen. We're going to play a song that talks about unity. It was recorded in the early 70s by Billy Preston. It's called That's the Way God Planned It. Here's a song for all you pilgrims called Wavering Stranger. I'm just a See you. 
to make. And the Lord revealed something to me in my heart. He said, Dana, this is a decision that you're going to have to make every day of your life. And it's the decision to defend the helpless. The decision to go the unpopular way. The decision to put yourself last and put someone else first, which I've learned is real love, because real love takes sacrifice. And Jesus was giving me a personal challenge to not go the popular way. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to church. I'm not trying to say that I shouldn't go to church. Everybody should go to church. But we shouldn't fill our lives with so many meetings and gatherings and Bible studies that we don't have time to help the poor, that we don't have time to help the prisoners. When I look into my Bible, there's a most astounding statement in the book of James. He says, do you want to know what pure and undefiled religion really is? It's not how many uh, buses your church has or how big the choir is. But real, pure, and undefiled religion is taking care of widows in distress and orphans. That's what religion is. And you know, I hear Jesus echoing those words all through the scripture. He talks about the little things. He doesn't talk about the big campaigns. He talks about the little things that are important. In fact, I read in the scripture about the day of judgment in Matthew. Where is that guy? Oh, yeah. It says this. At the day of judgment, as he's separating the sheep from the goats, he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You know, man, when Jesus tells you to go visit the old people at the senior citizens' home, it's not a real glorious ministry. You know what I mean? You probably will not get any TV coverage for that kind of ministry. But you've got to remember, you're not really going to visit old people. You're going to visit Jesus Christ. And you may say, when you're called on to do the prison ministry, well, man, some of those guys in there don't deserve for anybody to come visit them. My friend, the call is to visit Jesus Christ. And you would visit him. And on the day of judgment, I don't see Jesus asking people, man, list me how many social clubs were you in? Tell me how many Bible studies you were in. How many Bible doctrines have you memorized? And I'm not trying to undermine those things. Those things are important. But the things that Jesus Christ talks about on the day of judgment were, did you give that man a drink of water? Did you go over and see that guy when he was sick? Were you willing to take care of the widows, the orphans? Did you visit the prisons? That's what he's going to want to know, friends. And so you got to make a decision every day of your life. Are you going to take care of the poor? Are you going to take care of the powerless? Are you going to do for the unlovely people in the world. There's not a lot of glory in that, my friends, but that's the calling and the responsibility that you and I have. Here's a song that we wrote that's about losers, losers that become winners in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thank you. 
Methodist Church, please go to the first aid immediately. From Oakland, New Jersey, Methodist Church, first aid. Presently to us today, we've never played here before, and I thank you for being very kind to us. I'd like to say just a couple of things about commitment to Christ. I've already talked a little bit about it, and I'm not going to take very much time, but I just want to say a couple more things, okay? There's a lot of people in America today that are taking out fire insurance policies against hell. But my friend, the gospel that I find in the New Testament doesn't look like a fire insurance policy. And what I mean by a fire insurance policy is the kind of people who feel like they can ask Jesus to come into their life and then live their life without holiness. And my friend, the scripture says that without holiness, nobody will see God. Jesus Christ demands personal holiness from his people. And if you truly belong to Jesus Christ, holiness will be your nature. It will be your desire to be holy. There's a lot of people teaching today, and the temptation is very easy if you're an evangelist or a speaker on a stage to make it sound very easy to give your life to Jesus Christ. And it is very easy. But I'll tell you one thing that it requires in order to give your life to Jesus Christ and to follow Him. It requires everything. You remember the story about the rich young ruler? Here's a guy that was really a religious guy. You know, he kept all the commandments. He probably had a summer home in Jerusalem. You know, he went to synagogue and ate bagels and lox and did the whole nine yards or whatever. And he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what can I do to have eternal life? Jesus told him, keep the commandments. And the guy turned around and lied and said, oh, I've kept the commandments from birth. Well, Jesus didn't challenge him on that. He said, great. And if you've kept the commandments, come and follow me. Obviously, if you keep the commandments, you're a spiritual person and you'll recognize that I am the Messiah. So come and follow me. But first, he said, Go sell your possessions. You're not going to need them. Then he found the thing in the man's life that he loved more than he loved God. Man, I find Jesus Christ all the time in my life whispering those things into my ears that I put before him that I love more than him. And he's challenging me every day to put those things on a lower place on my priority list than I put him. Because Jesus Christ demands, my friend, to be first. And unless there's been a time in your life where you've surrendered yourself and said, Okay, Jesus, I'll go where you want me to go, and I'll do what you want me to do. I'll give up my possessions. I'll give up my family. I'll give up anything that you ask me to give up because I acknowledge that you are Lord of the universe and my King. That's when a person gets saved. Amen. And we're in a struggle every day of our Christian life to fulfill those commitments that we made on that day. But my friend, if you came to Jesus Christ making a contractual agreement, I'm afraid you came away with a fire insurance policy. But it's not going to do you any good. You don't make deals with Jesus. The deal is I gave my life for you, and if you want to be saved, you'll have to lose your life in order to find it. And you'll have to take up your cross and follow me. I'm not saying that good works save a man. Don't get me wrong. A man is saved by faith. But his faith is demonstrated by his works. And that's why I say that we need to be holy, my friends. Now let me tell you, let me, let me make a practical application. What does it mean to be holy? It means to turn off the television set sometimes. Does it not? It means being obedient to your employers and serving him like you would serve Christ. Does it not mean that? Yes, it does. It means witnessing in places where Jesus' name is not very popular except for in a cuss phrase. It means a lot of things that cost you a lot. You have to put yourself aside and make Jesus Lord and Master. And if you've got any other deal with Jesus Christ other than that, you've got a bad deal, my friends. And I'd like for everyone who is in this audience that hears my voice today, I'd like for you to know when you leave this place that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. And that you're not offering anything less to Him but everything because that's what he demands of you. I'm not saying it's not a struggle. It's a struggle. 
We have to reevaluate every day. I have to rededicate my life to Jesus every day. I used to uh, go to a Southern Baptist church and they had an emphasis on walking down the aisle. There's nothing wrong with that. But we'd, every time we'd have rededication, I'd show up down the front of the church and the pastor finally got sick of it and said, Key, what do you keep coming down here for? I said, I have to get right with God. He said, well, you don't have to rededicate your life once in a while. I said, well, when I read the scripture, it looks like i got to rededicate my life every day. So don't, don't count these words as a blasting. Count them as a blessing and an encouragement.